The gospel lesson comes from the gospel according to John. Hear what the Spirit says to the church. Now, there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh. What is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen. Yet if I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The Gospel of the Lord. I begin with commendations for you having moved your clock ahead. Well done. Now if some folks are, and they will, show up during the last hymn, be very kind and gracious to them and understand it. Years ago, while a wedding was taking place in the sanctuary, a woman came in to the church and sat back there on one of the back pews. She didn't seem to be a wedding guest. She had her suitcase with her, and she looked as though she might have just kind of wandered in off the street. I was locking the front door. The, the wedding guests had left for the reception, and she came up to me and asked, well, it was more like accosted me and, and said, I'm new here. I'm looking for a church. Are you the pastor? I, I said, yes, ma'am, I, I am the pastor. Well, tell me, is this a Bible-believing church? I said, well, we, we think the Bible is God's word. Sure, we're, we're a Bible-believing church. Well, she said, is it an evangelical church? Well, we certainly believe the story of Jesus is good news. So, yes, I'd say we're an evangelical church. Well, she said, is this a born-again church? Ma'am, I said, we take the sacrament of baptism very seriously. We believe that to be baptized is to die with Christ and to be raised to new life with him. So... I would say we are a, a, an evangelical, Bible-believing, born-again church. And she looked at me, dressed as I was that day in a black Geneva gown and preaching band. She, she said, well, it sure don't look like one to me. <laughs> Every three years, like clockwork, we 
enter this conversation that Nicodemus has with Jesus in John's Gospel. Nicodemus is that Torah expert who wants to know more about Jesus and what his message is. And unlike some of his learned colleagues, he is not someone who asks Jesus loaded questions in order to try to prove that he's a fake prophet. No, Nicodemus seems genuinely interested in who Jesus is and what he represents. Now it's true, he comes to Jesus by night, probably to avoid being spotted with an unlicensed, non-tutored, non-tenured, homegrown prophet from Nazareth. As a respected member of the academy, he certainly doesn't want to be seen with certain people. Still, unlike his colleagues, he seems not to be able to dismiss Jesus out of hand. There's something about Jesus, something that he can't quite put his finger on, and he is willing to take a little bit of a risk. So it turns out that Nicodemus, for all his advanced education, is in the dark in more ways than one. There are a couple of things you need to know about the language used in this passage of John's Gospel. Little subtleties embedded in the Greek text that don't come over right away in English. The first is a switch in the text between the singular second person and the plural second person. In other words, between you and y'all. It, it happens about halfway through the conversation. Jesus stops saying you and starts saying the plural you, which is y'all. It's as though he's inviting all of us in, into this conversation that he is having with Nicodemus. And the second thing you, you need to know is the Greek word anothen can mean again, it can mean anew, it can even mean from above. In fact, in Matthew's gospel, when Jesus is dying on the cross and breathes his last breath, Matthew says, the curtain in the temple is torn anothen from the top to the bottom. Jesus says to Nicodemus, no one can see this kingdom of God unless one is born a nothen. And Nicodemus takes that to mean again, which makes no sense to him, and he says as much. How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? A pastor friend of mine was reading this story to his little girl, Ellie, who was about five at the time. And with them was Ellie's little brother, who was about six months old. And he said, Ellie, what do you think? Is, is, is Nicodemus right? Do you think your brother could, could enter the womb again? And, and Ellie said, ha, no way, he's too big. Besides, he couldn't see. He couldn't see. The same can be said of Nicodemus. He just can't see. He, he can't understand what all this talk about being born anothen might mean. Born from above, born again. Nothing fits into his predetermined frame of reference. His excellent theological education is getting in the way of learning something new. This kind of thing happens all the time in John's Gospel, as you probably know. Jesus operates on this plane while everybody else is stumbling along on another plane. Nicodemus is concerned with precise definitions and clear meanings. He wants to know exactly how to see the kingdom of God, how to get closer to God, the God who spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai and gave the law, but is so high and holy and lifted up that no one dare get too close. 
And Jesus seems to be saying that Nicodemus is trying too hard. He is closer to the kingdom than he knows. Being born a nothen is a matter of water and the spirit. It's not an achievement. Don't be astonished that I said to you, you must be born a nothen. The wind blows where it chooses and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. How can these things be? Nicodemus asks. Poor Nicodemus. <laughs> He's never met anyone quite like Jesus. None of his professors in seminary mentioned the wind blowing where it will. If they had, it would have been on the exam at the end of the year. How could he have missed this? And how can it be that Nicodemus is so drawn to this enigmatic teacher whose words are so ambiguous and yet so compelling? It's at this point in the narrative that the pronoun you shifts from the singular to the plural. It's as though Jesus is turning away from Nicodemus and facing each one of us. He talks about the Son of Man being lifted up in much way that the same way that Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Just as we're getting out our cell phones to Google that obscure Old Testament reference, Jesus gets to the heart of the matter. No more wordplay. No more need to look something up. Put down your cell phone. Look Jesus in the eye. He's talking now about love. About God's love for the world. About God's love for you. God's love made flesh in Jesus Christ, the Son of Man, who is talking to you right now. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son so that everyone who believes in him might not perish but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world but that the world might be saved through him. For, for most of us, those are familiar words. Perhaps you, as I did, learned and memorized them as a child. I used to think they meant that only Christians would make it into the kingdom of God. The wind that blows where it chooses would never encompass folks who don't profess Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. I don't think that way anymore. I realize now that I was making the same mistake that Nicodemus makes. These words are not and never should have been a formula for excluding some people from the love of God. These words speak of believing in the Son of Man, of having faith in Him. But in John's Gospel, faith in Jesus is not adherence to doctrine about Jesus. It's not a creed. It's not a formula. In John's Gospel, believing is not even really a noun. It's a verb. With believing in Jesus comes all the ambiguity, uncertainty, and muddiness that comes with being human. To believe in God's word made flesh is to follow the divine light that illumines our shared darkness. Faith in Jesus is walking with him, encountering with him the hungry and the poor and the disenfranchised and people like this guy Nicodemus who longed to be closer to God, but aren't sure they can take the risk of having to change their minds about who God is and what God truly
truly wants for the world God loves. I wasn't being really flippant with that lady. I, I was being truthful. I do believe that the Bible is the word of God because it tells the truth about us and about God. I do believe that the news of God's word made flesh is good news and that makes me an evangelical. And that's a term I just refuse to relinquish just because some folks have dragged it through the mud of partisan politics. I do believe that in order to enter the fullness of that good news, one must be born a no thin, but I will leave the meaning of that word where it belongs in this marvelous, infuriating ambiguity of John's ingenious gospel. We meet Nicodemus two more times in the fourth gospel. The second time is when the tension between Jesus and the religious authorities is at its height. The council is trying to get the temple police to arrest Jesus. And Nicodemus pipes up, Our law does not judge people without first giving them a hearing to find out what they are doing, does it? Is Nicodemus defending Jesus? Or is he merely scoring academic points? <laughs> John leaves it for us to decide. And the last time we meet Nicodemus, he and Joseph of Arimathea are preparing the pierced and broken body of our Lord for burial. Nicodemus has brought along 100 Roman pounds of burial spices. That's 75 pounds in modern reckoning. An enormous and expensive gesture of, of what? Belief, respect, regret, devotion. God knows. A and isn't that the point? The wind blows where it will. The spirit works in mysterious ways. There are as many ways to be born a no then as there are dimensions of God's love for the world. Perhaps to us, Nicodemus sure don't look like he's been born again. But what we think really doesn't matter, does it? What about you? Have you been born again? Are you being born again? This much is sure. The Spirit blows where it will. And God loves you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.